morning, everybody. Alan's going to be uh, preaching to us today and, and uh, speaking from the book of Psalms, in, uh, Psalm 107. I thought that uh, I would just read the beginning of that psalm to start our service out. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. So that's how the psalm starts out, and we're going to um, start in that spirit uh, by beginning with a song of thanksgiving this morning. So please stand and join us. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same, cause you came near. From the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's only Son. And you lived and you died and you rose again on high and you opened the way for the world to live again hallelujah for all you've done my savior redeemer lifted me from the miry clay almighty forever i will never be the same because you came near from the everlasting to the world we live the father's only son and you lived and you died and you rose again on high and you opened the way for the world to live again hallelujah for all you've done Hallelujah for all you've done. 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 Because you came near. From the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's only Son. And you lived, and you died, and you rose again on high, and you opened the way for the world to live again. Yeah, you lived, and you died, and you rose again on high and you opened the way for the world to live again hallelujah for all you've done hallelujah for all you've done In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failure, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. 
You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. I won't fear what tomorrow brings. With each morning I'll rise and sing My God's love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea And you're my lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you, my lighthouse my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Fire before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Fire before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Fire before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Fire before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storms. And you're my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will steer me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Safe to shore. You may be seated. Hi, good morning, and thanks for coming to Albany Alliance Church. We really glad we are really glad for everyone that's here. We do enjoy worshiping the Lord, and this is a house of God, a place where we worship the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And most of us here have read the Bible either completely or in part, and we've decided, yeah, we believe that this person, Jesus of Nazareth in history, we believe he was the Christ. And we have no fear of the last day as we've committed our lives to him because as Jesus said to his disciples, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. As you know, our pastor is Pastor Bill Smith, and uh, he had surgery this week, so he's not here. I hear he's doing well, and I'd like to just take a moment to pray for him, if you'll pray with me. Lord God, how we do praise, pray for Pastor Bill Smith. We are grateful for his faithful efforts on our behalf. We pray that you would help him and lift him up as he gives tirelessly to this church. We are grateful for him, and we ask that you would give him your special anointing and heal him. We pray he could have 100% recovery quickly. And we pray that you would protect he and Catherine and lead them as they lead us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I just want to go over the announcements real quick. Um, we don't have that many. Uh, there is next Sunday after church, uh, there's a luncheon for anyone who is interested in being a worker with the youth of this church. 
That is, uh, we all miss uh, Pastor Joe and his wife Maya were our youth. For people who are actually interested in being workers, um, it isn't really for uh, the kids themselves or for the parents or the guardians of the kids. So if you're interested uh, in working with the youth, uh, please come out for that. And then uh, there will be an elder meeting on July 10th. Uh, Alliance Women will be meeting July 16th at 10 a.m. and there's a Board of Ministries meeting on uh, July 23rd at 6. Also, if you're visiting in front of you, you should see there's a visitor card somewhere. We'd really love to know your name, not so that we can uh, harangue you with emails, because we do care that you have a place to worship God where you might feel comfortable and feel like somebody cares about you in this world. That's important. Uh, thank you. Let's continue our worship. Okay, if anybody uh, wants to use the hymnal, we're going to sing a hymn next. Uh, I believe it's hymn number 36. The words will also be up on the screen if you don't want to use the hymnal. Um, but figured we'd give you both choices. Let's stand and continue to worship. God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, in endless years the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guard while troubles last and our eternal home. Through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. 
Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh, when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus breathe call these bones to live call these lungs to sing once again I will praise and breathe and call these bones to live and call these lungs to sing once again I will praise Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus 
silence fear Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome Your name is alive forever lifted high Your name cannot be overcome Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, 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 you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you are the rock that we can run to, the rock that we can cling to, the one who can bring peace to the storm. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you. And I feel, Lord, like this is the message that you've been uh, recounting for several weeks in a row now to us and uh, usually there's a reason why you speak in, in repeated ways uh, and usually it's, it's to emphasize something to us Lord and I think you've been emphasizing to us in the past few weeks that we can come to you with all of our burdens with all of our fears with all of our sins, with all of our addictions, with all of our struggles, with all of the things that surround us in this world. We don't have to be mowed under by this stuff, Lord, because you're, you're a God who is a deliverer. So, Lord, in, in, our, in our time now, remind us of it, but after we leave this place, too, I ask, Lord, that you would remind us that we can turn to you all the time because you're not just here. You're everywhere because you dwell with us. you for being Emmanuel, the God who dwells with us. Amen. And you may be seated. Kids are dismissed. The kids are dismissed for kids' worship. So a couple weeks ago, uh, I was here for this message that Pastor Bill did, and uh, it really just helped me so much 
because he talked about the uh, passage in Luke 8 where the disciples were in the boat with Jesus. And uh, so much in my life, I know personally, I've had times where I, I'm just like, I must be doing something wrong. You know, all these people are walking around so happy following the Lord, and I'm just carrying around all this care and concern. But um, that message really spoke to my heart, you know, that Christ being in the boat with us. Now, it so happens, I once read this devotional, and it linked that passage in Luke 8 with Jesus in the boat. It linked it with Psalm 107. So what, and I talked to pastor about this, and I, I really want to do, but this is part B of that. You know, when you used to play the 45 records, yeah, if you're, if you're, none of us are that old, but uh, you would have side B. So this is side B to, to what pastor preached. And I, this is what pastor read uh, last time. I'm going to review, just to read this. This is just such a great story. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided. And all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And the, the main two points that I got out of what Pastor Bill said is, one is it's not about the deliverance. It's about the aspect of that deliverance, which is to say, who was it? What was, who was their deliverance? And the answer in the beginning and the end of it was Jesus was about their deliverance. The other part, and this is what Pastor Bill said was a deeper lesson, and it really ministered to me, was he said, basically, that each of us has a destiny, and he read Romans eight twenty eight through 30. So, he also said, and we serve the God who in the Old Testament had the ability to change the weather. And that brings us to today. Okay, so Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verses 23 through 30. And I want you to listen to this. This is so incredible. This is Old Testament. doesn't have anything to do with the disciples. But think of this as though it's the disciples saying it. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of, it, of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. So... I want to ask, and I really believe this is appropriate in this context, I want to ask, what is your experience with God like? And I ask that of myself, too. But what, what is our experience with God like? You know, I saw this thing when I was a kid. They used to have these TV commercials, and Pat Boone would come on and say, you know, you can have a personal relationship with God. And I thought... This is horrible, but I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. What is this guy talking about? And I, I just, I, it, it was so ridiculous, I, I just couldn't believe it. The odd thing is, is that God wants a relationship with us. Here, today, in 2024. And 
We speak here today to two kinds of people, okay? Two kinds of people. One are us, the needy in this world. The needy. And the needy are not celebrated and praised, in, not in our culture or in a media culture. Now, possible problems of the needy, okay? And I'm just picking these out. I don't have anybody in mind here other than myself for a lot of these, but uh, possible problems of the needy. No one cares about me. I suffer from horrible depression. I don't have enough money to feed my family. I can't read well, and it makes life really hard. I have no enjoyment in anything. I'm addicted to alcohol. I'm just so lonely. I love my sins so much, and I know God won't take me. Now, that's the first type of person. That's the needy person. And Jesus was famous for saving the needy. It wasn't that he healed their arms and hands and their eyes and their ears and their inability to speak. Those were incredible things. The depth of what he did was to bring them to a knowledge about himself. It was saving faith. When he went to the cross and the women were weeping because they're watching this horrible scene of this man bleeding, and Jesus said, weep for yourselves. He knew of their judgment day, and so did God. And God made a way so that all of us who are going to face God for the careless words we've ever spoken, we can have all those things forgiven outright. Now, that's the needy person, okay? They, they have all these needs. There's the second type of person here, and that's the person who isn't needy, <laughs> the strong person. And in this person, I know it's true for myself, we are attracted in this life to strong people, and our culture praises strong people, and rightly so. And the godly man, I believe, is the strong person who gives out love and mercy to everyone around them, despite the fact that they're strong and they don't necessarily need people like we the needy do. But sometimes there's that strong person who's not needy, likes life, and doesn't really have a need for anything. And those are the people that just like the needy need to be convicted of their sin. When we're needy, we, we say, yeah, please help me, Lord. And yeah, I'm a sinner. I know it. And we believe we're sinners. But the man who is not needy has to realize that God says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says, it, Jesus said, if you are angry with your brother, you will be subject to judgment. It says in Leviticus, if you want to go Old Testament, do not hate your brother in your heart. I said these a few weeks ago, but in the end, it's Galatians 3.22, and I didn't give Carl this verse, but I'm going to read it. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. So every one of us here is in the same boat, and we cry out to God. And that brings us to today. Why? Because what were these two passages about? Whether you go Old Testament, and it's the psalmist, he's saying, you know, those people who ride the high seas, and those men who are fishermen there, they're talking about the Mediterranean Sea, I'm convinced, which is essentially the ocean. Those people who see 15-foot swells in the middle of the night with winds that don't let up, believe me, men of the sea, what do they say? There are no atheists in foxholes. Well, there are no atheists out on the ocean in the middle of some great-scale storm. If there were a title, say, to a talk like this, you could call it 
the high seas of life. And it's very simple. Believers in this life see danger, great danger. Verse 25, Psalm 107, verse 25. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. God spoke and stirred up the tempest. In the New Testament passage that Pastor Bill taught on, Jesus had his disciples get into the boat. And the difference between those passages is very simple. Jesus was in the boat with them. Now, I know the theological among us are going to tell us that Jesus was in the boat with them in the Old Testament, too. That's fine. I agree with you. But we can't ignore the fact of the proximity of Jesus being in the boat with them and Jesus sleeping among them. Think of a situation in your life that is out of control. This is what Pastor Bill was talking about. Pastor Bill also said, God allows it. You know, when they brought that blind man to Jesus and said, okay, the man's blind. They said, who sinned, this man, because he's blind, or his parents? Is that why he's blind? Because his parents sinned? And Jesus is, is like neither. This man is blind so that the glory of God could be brought forth. Now, just like I looked at Pat Boone when I was a kid saying, what's he talking about on TV here about a relationship with God? So we might say, why is Jesus giving this answer? This blind man is healed so God could be glorified. If we don't know the Lord in our hearts, that's not going to sound like any reason. But as we're believers and we understand, as Pastor Bill said, because of Romans 8, 28 through 30, we have a destiny in our lives. That destiny is to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we as believers have an understanding of these trials, sometimes horrible trials in this life. Most people don't know about the deep, hard things that go on in our homes, the tough things that we endure, the kind of trials that endure for a year, a year, some people 10 years. The book of Hebrews says what? Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. Ouch. <laughs> The, the second half of that, God is treating us as sons. I know for myself, I often reckon the trials I've had in this life and gotten bitter. And years ago, there was a time where I did not follow the Lord, even though I was a Christian. And I believe a large part of that bitterness for myself comes because I've come to doubt my sonship in Jesus Christ. You know, we say to people, Rance isn't here, so I'll use him as an example. Rance says to me, you know, yeah, I know I'm going to die or something. He says, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that kind of confidence is great and praiseworthy and what God wants for us. He says what? Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. If we don't really take hold of that hope, then we have such doubt and then the hard times are gonna seem relentless and hopeless and helpless. So believers see the danger and inevitably, inevitably when they see the danger, the fear follows, right? Verse 26, Psalm 107, verse 26. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Pastor Bill said, helpless, we're helpless and hopeless. 
when we focus on our circumstances rather than the creator. The aspect of the disciples' faith, that is, their faith was in Jesus. Who did they go to? Their master. Lamentations, if you've ever read it, is a really good book for those of us who have felt saddened by life. Even if we've been saddened up to the point of not wanting to be on this earth any longer. When we're swallowed up with a chasm of depression, which we cannot explain, maybe even to our spouses. And it says in Lamentations 3.13, he pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. This is, uh, this is some person speaking about what God, they feel, they feel like God has done in their lives. Lamentations 3.20. Lamentations 3.20. I remember my affliction and my wandering. The bitterness and the gall. I remember them well, and my soul is downcast. You know, you, you could easily say, that's, that's Jeremiah, or, or it's attributed to Jeremiah, I don't know which, but it sounds like David, you know, David wrote some immense number of the Psalms. David wrote stuff like that, and David was one serious warrior, tough, tough, knew how to lead Israel. He had slain Goliath. He had experienced the wrath of his king, his former friend, hunting him down in the desert so that he feared for his life and had no food. Amazingly, in that trial... It was the downcast and the displaced. The scripture tells us that went to live with David in the desert. Now, David's entire life wasn't spent in the desert, but it was a long time, a long time from the time Samuel showed up in his house and said, here is this short man here. Here is the next king of Israel. And Saul heard of this and hunted him down like a dog. David knew the fear, as Jeremiah knew the fear, as we know the fear. Why? Because no servant is greater than his master. I take it sometimes, you know, we hear Jesus died on the cross, Jesus died on the cross. And that life that he knew was a hard, miserable life. In, in so far as I reckon, I hate to say that, but I mean, it, what other conclusion can we come to? I've had times, I read the New Testament, like every time he turns around, you know, Jesus did this, so they tried to kill him. You know, they were threatened by Jesus, so they tried to kill him. You, you know, and there's no defense. You know, you may be the Sadducees and Pharisees and the chief priests and the highest in Israel, but I'm the one living a righteous life. You folks are really the hypocrites. We don't see anything like that. No defensiveness, just prayer. And a knowledge that he had to do his father's will. And this is, is what we seek. So, believers experience danger. Believers experience fear. The emotions associated with what we see as the circumstances which will swallow us under. These are the high seas of life. Inevitably, verse 28, Psalm 107, verse 28. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. And I was talking to Jeff last week and we were talking about Psalm 107. What we're speaking today, this whole business, this cycle of going through danger and then the danger to the crying out, to the being delivered, 
That's repeated over and over, four times in Psalm 107, in different circumstances. You got a guy in prison, you know, but he cries out to the Lord, and God cuts through the bars for him, and he's out of the prison. Sinners, people, even we who have been headstrong in our ways, in our sins, even if it's been for years, and if God brings us to the point where we say, I am tired of living like a hypocrite in my lies to myself, we repent and ask God for help. In my life, I was so unhappy with the Christian life and watched movies endlessly, hoping to find emotions that associated with the sadness I felt over the burdens of this world. And I had a horrible dream one night, and I knew the scriptures pretty well. I wasn't, I knew the scriptures pretty well, and I, I was so unhappy. And all these devotions, and I'd read all these Christian books, and they just wouldn't do anything for me. And I would wake up and try and have devotions, and all right, I'm going to praise. Now I should praise God for this. I should praise God for this. And I should thank God for this. And I should thank God for this. And, and I pray for the salvation of every person on my street. And generally that would last. The most I could get was two days in a row, sometimes three. And then I would have a period of, you know, a year of just sort of hobbling around in my depression. And um, then in 2010, I had this horrible dream. And I woke up and I repented. And God made, like, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I just felt like, you know, I've got to do this. So for the next six weeks, I would cry out to God to help me because I was so terrified of going back and just being the same horrible person that I had been. And I don't know how it happened, but I quit drinking. I just, I had tried so long just to stop sinning, and I just couldn't. And God just did something to me where all of a sudden, all this scripture that I had learned started to really make a difference. Psalm 34 says in verse 6, This poor man called. And the Lord saved him out of all his troubles. What we're believing in when we cry out to God, I can't emphasize this enough. This is why the Old Testament psalm by itself doesn't work. The Old Testament psalm by itself does work wonderfully well if we take all of the Old Testament references to the Messiah, including Psalm 22, which says our names are written on his hands. That's a psalm and we can read about Jesus being crucified in Psalm 22. The other great one is Isaiah 53, but currently I have 25 uh, references to Jesus in the Old Testament. And if we took all of those about the Messiah and we took Psalm 107, we could start to get a pretty good picture of our Savior. Nevertheless, salvation comes from knowledge, and knowledge comes by revelation. That is the revelation of the scriptures as taught, as teaching about Jesus Christ. 
So we do say the name Jesus, and we read about Jesus in the boat, and now we have a clear pathway to understanding how we will live for Christ. The difference isn't just the crying out, it's the man to whom we cry out, and that is Jesus. The last thing that these believers witness, they've had the danger and they've had the fear and they've cried out. And what they witness in both stories is deliverance. It says in verse 29, he stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. If you take the other boat story, the one where Jesus is walking on water, they land at Gennesaret, and Gennesaret was a two-mile by four-mile garden spot. you got to love the symbolism and the reality of it for the disciples. Jesus said, where is your faith? And was he, pastor was right. He wasn't trying to crush them like a grape. But I think what Jesus was getting at in admonishing his disciples there was, I mean, it was good they cried out to Jesus. Who else are you going to go to, right? <laughs> it was good they cried out to Jesus, but Psalm 32.10, this describes what Jesus was after. Psalm 32.10. Psalm 32 is a real big dog when it comes to the Psalms. Psalm 32.10. The Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. It's great the disciples cried out to Jesus. But I don't know. I think the person I would really respect is... The person who, you know, you think of these people that are older than ourselves, maybe a couple of decades older, and we watch them quietly walking with the Lord, and then we find out what's going on in their lives. And we see that they're just going through life calm, and we know they're trusting the Lord. How do we know that's right? Because it says in the book of Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please him. What, what else does it say? It says that a hope that's seen is no hope at all. That, that's why God has no desire to fill our bank accounts endlessly so that we'll just have a no, no care in the world. I mean, it could work that way for some folks. But he puts the circumstances in our lives. He stirs up the tempest. And so we come to it. The cycle of the Christian life. And I don't mean to sum this up like it's ju some just cheap mechanics or something. But it is true. And that is this. Believers see danger. Believers fear bad things, believers cry out, and believers get deliverance. And it recently ministered to me that even the Apostle Paul had that one thing that he kept going to the Lord about it. And what was the Lord's answer? My grace is sufficient for thee. And I get so just unhappy sometimes that God just doesn't take my trials away. And it's completely antithetical to the scripture, I think, to think like that, or could be antithetical. If you think about manna in the Old Testament, those that tried to gather on Sunday and went out and gathered the manna, what happened to the manna? It started to stink, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, in the Old Testament, the Israelites got bread from heaven. They're out in the desert. There's no food. God, every day, would rain down bread from heaven that is this 
It was like uh, coriander seed, and it gathered on the ground. And they would go out daily and gather the manna. And it said on Saturday, gather twice as much. But people that went out and tried to gather on Sunday, even though they didn't need to, that that would perish, that, that manna. It would stink. They couldn't have it. So m my point is this, that God's mercies, like Lamentations says, are new every morning. And I, I go to God now out of desperation. You know, I used to have this whole fear of, oh, I don't have quiet time. God's not going to love me. I don't have quiet time. God's not going to love me. I mean, I did that for, I don't know, a lot of years. And uh, now I, I don't worry about whether I'm having quiet time or not. I just go to God out of sheer desperation because i got so many things i got to face in the world. And he helps me every day. I have miracles. I have so many miracles written down. I had encourage us, you know, if you... Somebody told me this, and I started doing it, and I write down my miracles. I write them down, and I don't tell people about my miracles a lot of time because I, I don't really think they'll necessarily believe in them, but I remember what God's done for me, and God makes it. He's not filling our bank accounts with endless good things and no problems. It just generally doesn't happen. He makes us cry out for the manna every day and what's the motive in all of this love because he loves you we're going to end on this I'm going to read the daisy chain the daisy chain of God's love for us And this is what Pastor Bill read last week. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose for those God foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Thank you, Alan. It's kind of amazing how the Lord ties so many things together. Sitting there listening to Alan, and he's pulling out some verses from Lamentations. And the people who were at Delta Lake this past week uh, know that the central verse that they focused on was from Lamentations as well. Um, Actually, Alan even cited that verse as well. Um, and what it says is that his mercies are new every morning and his faith and great is his faithfulness. And that's in this last song that we're going to sing too. Um, not by happenstance, but that's not why I selected the song. I selected it because it talks about storms and dealing with storms in our lives but talks about his faithfulness too and this is the way that God speaks to us like tying things together it's mind blowing but I know it's how he speaks um, let's stand and sing this together
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. God, from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and you're true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. For great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. He'll never let me down. For great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. For great is your faithfulness to me. Now to him who is able to do far more than all we can ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us to him be the glory forever and ever amen <laughs>